Well, welcome again. Welcome to One in Messiah, Shabbat Shalom. Um, before we start, we're actually going to do a teaching from John's first letter. How many of the people know John wrote three letters? And of course, he also wrote the gospel. <laughs> so this is his first letter. We're actually going to do the whole first chapter. It's very, very short. But like we just sang those songs about the glory and glory coming down and all of these great lyrics, we're going to see, John's going to explain to us how they beheld the glory. He and his fellow apostles, fellow disciples. But before we start that, with apologies to Don and Linda, because they're going to hear this for the third time, yesterday, as you may or may not know, was a commemoration of a day called Tish B'Av, the ninth day of the month of Av. And it's a sad day of mourning that, you know, the, the date varies between the middle of July and the middle of August because it's based on a lunar calendar, not a solar calendar. So every year it's a different date. It was yesterday. And on the ninth day of the month of Av, the spies came back from spying out the land in the book of Numbers, and Joshua and Caleb had the faith, had the good report. The other 10 said, nope, there's no way we can do it. There's no way we can take them. And so the people, everybody over the age of 20 was cursed to die in the wilderness and would not see the land except Joshua and Caleb. All the people who got to the land were under the age of 20 when they left Egypt or were born in the wilderness. And it says in the account that the people cried that day because they were so scared of the report that these spies had given. And so the ancient rabbis, when they studied that, said, this is going to be a day of crying and mourning forever because the people cried and didn't believe. So in 586 BC, the first temple was destroyed on the ninth day of Av. In 70 AD, the second temple was destroyed on the ninth day of Av. In 133, I think it was, AD, the Romans brutally put down a rebellion and killed thousands of Jews. The following year, on the ninth day of the month of Av, they plowed under the Temple Mount and put salt in the ground so nothing would ever grow there. In 1,000 and something, on the day of Tishbab, the ninth of Av, the first crusade started, which led to the murder of hundreds of thousands of Jews and hundreds of thousands of Muslims, because the crusaders sacked Constantinople. You know, nice Christian war. They sacked the Eastern Christians, took all kind of valuable stuff, massacred Jews, massacred Arabs when they got to the land. In 1290, all the Jews were expelled from England on the ninth day of the month of Av. In 1306, all the Jews were expelled from France on the ninth day of the month of Av. In 1492, a day we know well, the Inquisition arranged for Ferdinand and Isabella to expel every Jew from Spain on the ninth day of the month of Av and took them to North Africa and to the Middle East. They're the Sephardic Jews of today. Isn't that amazing? World War I started on the ninth day of Av. And you think, well, you know, that doesn't really have much to the Jew, for the Jews. But when you think about it, the way World War I ended, it led to Hitler. It, it led to the Nazis because it had a bad ending. In 1941, at a meeting outside of Berlin, the Nazi leaders got together and made the final solution where they said, well, we're just going to kill all the Jews. And it was published on the ninth day of the month of Av. In 1942, on the ninth day of the month of Av, they started to expel Jews from Warsaw and take them to Treblinka. And two years later, on the ninth day of the month of Av, the Warsaw Ghetto fell a special SS unit went in and killed every Jew who was left in Warsaw and destroyed most of the city. All those things happened on Tishba'av, the ninth day of the month of Av. 
Now, I don't know, I'm not a good statistician, but I don't know what the odds would be of all those things happening on exactly the same date. It would be pretty astronomical. Whew, yeah, probably a trillion to one. But anyway, we're going to talk about First John now. <clears throat> Don and Linda heard that little explanation twice, but I'll limit the details tonight. <laughs> so, First John chapter 1. And like I say, John's letters are really short. The first one is so powerful, especially chapters 1 and 2. But chapter 1, verse 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled, concerning the word of life. The life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us. Three years with Jesus, three years with Yeshua. We saw him, we heard him, we looked at him, we touched him, the life that was with the Father was manifested to us in flesh. All those songs about the glory and all those songs about the majesty, now we have the incarnate God-man that John spent three years with and experienced with all their senses. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us and truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things which we write to you, that your joy may be complete. We want to tell you all these things that happened. We want to explain them all so that you can have fellowship with us. Now, he's talking, you know, to the people he knew. But also, it applies to us. So when we understand this, we have fellowship with each other. And as a result, we have fellowship with the Father and the Son so that our joy is complete. You don't really see a whole lot of joyful people in the world, right? You mostly see whiny people. You mostly see people who look morose and, you know, can't wait to tell you all their problems. But <clears throat> so he's talking about the person of Jesus. Right, when Moses wanted to see the glory, of course, in Exodus 33, I think it is. I can't think straight in this heat. <laughs> but in the book of Exodus, when Moses wanted to see the glory, God says, you can't see my glory. And live, you can't see it. I'll give you a glimpse, but you can't see my glory. But then in the first uh, chapter of the letter to the Colossians, Paul says that in Jesus of Nazareth, the fullness of the Godhead dwells because he's eternally God, right? So the fullness of the Godhead dwells in Jesus of Nazareth. So the people that saw him saw the glory of God. The people that saw little baby Jesus in the manger saw the glory of God. The people that experienced him like John, the people that saw him die, the people that saw him rise, the people that saw him ascend, experienced the whole glory of God in the person, Jesus of Nazareth. So they experienced his excellency and they had joy and fellowship because of it. They weren't the smartest guys. I mean, they were really a bunch of dopes. You know, John was one of the sons of thunder. He and his brother James. They just wanted to fight. Can we call down fire on those guys? And I love in the chosen where Jesus restrains them with his hand, arm and he says, you want to call fire and destroy those guys because they weren't nice to you and you don't like them and they don't like you. And then he says, what makes you think you're more worthy? Which is the big question. You know, if you say, I can't stand that guy over there. I wish God would deal with him. And what makes me think I'm more worthy than he is? Right? We know that. So we saw his excellency and we got joy and we got fellowship out of it. I mean, 
when these guys experienced the risen Christ and experienced the Great Commission and the Ascension all in the same short period of time, and then experienced the outpouring of the, of the Spirit on Pentecost, they had joy and they had fellowship. And they were able to put up with all the things that happened, all the sufferings that happened. You know, Paul writes so much stuff about all the things that are happening to him. He says, but I go on. I go on. And like I say, we don't want to do anything if it's raining. We don't want to do anything if we don't feel good or we feel tired. He's beaten with rods, stoned, left for dead, shipwrecked, put in prison, attacked by people. But he says, hey, well, you know, that's just how it is. I just keep going. So they had joy and fellowship because of this. And you remember John's gospel. I mean, the first chapter of John's gospel is amazing. It's absolutely amazing. Please go home and read chapter one for your homework. Because, you know, it starts with the word. In the beginning was the word. He has this concept. It comes from the Greek, you know, the Greek word logos. It comes from the Greek word. You know, to the Greeks, a word meant more than just a written word. It meant like a whole concept of things. Everything had fullness. The philosophers were always debating. You know, like if you said chair, you know, they would debate about what actually is a chair. Is, is it possible to have a perfect chair? Is there a chair somewhere in the universe that is the perfect chair? It wasn't just a word for them like it is for us, like, I'm going to sit in a chair. Word, the word, word, logos, had a much deeper meaning than it is just the word, word. And like I always tell you, I hate the fact that we get our word logo from this, because logo sounds so boring and so disrespectful compared to what logos actually meant. So John says that he's the logos, and the beginning was the word. And the word, the word was with God. And the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. And without him, nothing was made that was made. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness. And the darkness did not comprehend it. So he's in the beginning. He's the logos from the beginning. Is there a perfect word? Yes, Jesus. Is there a perfect chair somewhere? I don't know. Probably not. But is there a perfect word somewhere? Yes. Jesus is the perfect word. He's the eternal logos. He's with the Father. He's God. He was there from eternity. Everything was made. You know, in Colossians, again, in Colossians 1, Paul says he holds the whole universe together. He rules everything. He knows where everything is. In the whole universe. He doesn't say, oh, wait a minute, how did, how did that stuff get over there? Somehow that got by me. I, well, I don't know. No, he knows where every maverick molecule is, as, as um, Hank Hanegraaff always says. So he was life, and his life is the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness that we live in. But the world doesn't like the light, doesn't like the light. You know, in chapter 3, it tells us people don't like the light because their deeds are evil. And they don't want the light to expose them. Why do you think Hollywood people can talk about anything but Jesus? You know, politicians, anything but Jesus. People on TV, anything but Jesus. Because he's the light that shines on their deeds. And they can't have that. After all, they're rich and they're powerful. And they marry somebody else every couple of months. And they live how they want to live. And they do what they want to do. And, you know, they even go to Congress and testify like they're experts on something. They're actors and actresses. But they don't want to talk about Jesus because the darkness rejects the light. Just like if you're going to commit a crime, I mean, until recently, you wouldn't commit a crime in broad daylight. You wait till it's dark, right? 
You don't generally break into somebody's house at noon. You do it at midnight. So the light shines in the darkness. He's the word from the beginning. He's the light of life. The world doesn't comprehend him. The world we live in doesn't comprehend him. Why do you guys take this stuff so seriously? What, this is weird, what you guys believe. It's pretty narrow-minded, don't you think? Like a couple of weeks ago, we talked about the foolish message. Or was that last week? I can't remember. But we talked about a foolish message. We come with a foolish message. Yes, Jesus is the light. He's the only solution to your problem. He's the only way that you can be saved. He's the only way you can get back to the Father. He's the only way you can get your life straightened out. Do people on alcohol and drugs need rehabilitation? Yes. Do they need medical care? Yes. They need Jesus. How many people at the various churches all y'all go to have testimonies of how they've been delivered from drugs and they've been delivered from alcohol and they've been deliver, delivered from any number of lifestyles and problems? Because he's the light that shines into all of this. And so he starts with the word, and in his letter, he calls him the word of life. We have a logos whose life, he's, he's life. There never was a time that he wasn't. There's never going to be a time where he won't be. He's life that goes on eternally. And so here he calls him the word of life. And it says he's eternal. He's uncreated. He's the uncaused cause, as philosophers say. You know, when you're a little kid, like we just had with two of our little grandchildren this week, you know, you tell them God's always been alive. There never was a time when God wasn't. Well, how can that be? Well, we can't explain that. Right? Nobody can explain that because we live in time. He doesn't live in time. But he always was and always will be. He's the one who was, is, and is to come. He's always going to be there. And that's why his name is I Am, Yahweh, because it lives in the present tense. So he's eternal and he's uncreated. And here John presents the physical Jesus. Right? Divine Jesus, well, he's in the Godhead. He's in the Shekinah glory. He's giving the law to Moses. He says, you can't see my glory. Put him in the, put Moses in the rock. You can't see the divine Jesus because you can't look on God and live. Sometimes there's what's called a Christophany. Melchizedek, the guy who talks with um, Joshua, the guy who talks with... Um, Gideon, the guy who wrestles before that with Jacob. Those maybe are pre-incarnate manifestations of Jesus. But John saw Jesus of Nazareth. Not only saw him, hung out with him for three years. Three years. Day in, day out. They heard him and they saw him and they touched him. How many times did he walk into the camp and say, what do you guys cook and I'm hungry? Or, nah, I don't feel like eating today. I can't deal with you guys anymore today. I'm going to leave. I'm tired. I'm going to go to sleep. They saw the human Jesus of Nazareth, incarnate Jesus of Nazareth. They touched him. They saw him. They heard him. And calls him the word of life. And this word, the logos, could be heard, could be seen, could be touched. When he spoke, you heard a man's voice. Right? When he walked into a room and you turned to look and say, who's coming in? You saw a man walking in. He looked just like everybody else. Isaiah says there won't be anything that will call attention to him. He looks like everybody else. We know when they all walked into Panera's or they all went to Denny's for lunch and they all stood there in line and he gave the guy his order and 
everybody ordered and you know Judas paid him out of the purse. Oh come on, that's pretty funny. But he did pay him through the purse. You know, nobody nobody who was working behind the counter said, Wow, who's this? Because he looked like everybody else. He had the appearance of sinful flesh, but didn't have the sin. Paul tells us in Romans. So he could be seen, heard, and touched. They experienced him. Like we experience thing with things with our senses. Right? I mean, look at astronomy. Before there were like radio telescopes and all these other like radiation tele. We saw stars and planets because that's all we could do was see them with our eyes. Then when they got all these other things, it turned something into something we could process with our senses. And we found out there was more stuff because we process everything with our senses. They experienced him with their senses. They were with him for his whole ministry. They were at the transfiguration. Peter flips out. And who wouldn't? He doesn't even know what he's saying. Oh, this is great, Lord. Let me build a tent for you and one for Elijah and one for Moses. And we'll just kind of hang out here. They experienced a the transfiguration. They saw him die. John was at the foot of the cross. He saw him take his last breath. He saw the soldier. And you know, he writes in his gospel. He says, this is given by an eyewitness. He's talking about himself. The soldier puts the lance in his side and blood and water come out. He says, this is, eyewitness wrote this. It's me. I saw it happen. So they saw his resurrection. They saw him ascend from the top of the Mount of Olives. They experienced everything about him in a physical way. When Moses wants to experience the glory, he's not thinking about a dead redeemer. Right? He prefigures a dead redeemer, but he's not talking about John says, I saw him glorified. I saw him dead. I saw him glorified again. I saw him ascend into heaven with my senses. And when he talked, I heard him. If I bumped into him, I bumped into a real physical person, not a cosmic illusion. So he says, we experienced all these things. So the word, logos, was a man. The ultimate word, the ultimate logos, was manifested to them as a man. And he taught them, they heard a voice, they heard a word, they heard a logos right from the God-man himself. Remember the beginning of the book of Hebrews? Chapter 1. Oh, we're done with Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 1. You know, at various times in the past, paraphrasing, various times in the past, God spoke to us through prophets and through, you know, everybody got a different piece of the revelation over time. But now, he's spoken to us through his son, who's the ultimate messenger. Now, God is speaking in the body of a man. Not an artificial body, he's a real body. He's the God man. But the word, the logos, is coming physically out of his mouth through vocal cords, through air that comes up through the trachea, through the vocal cords, a speech center that triggers what he's going to say, in his temporal lobe. Pretty amazing. Just like we speak. <clears throat> Exodus 20. Now all the people witnessed the thundering, the lightning flashes, the sound of trumpets, the mountains smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood far off. Then they said to Moses, you speak with us and we will hear. But let, God, let not God speak with us lest we die. We can't process this. But we can process Moses' voice. Because he sounds like us. Right? If John comes up to tell us something, we can process what he's saying 
because we understand his voice and his voice is not strange to us. When you're looking up at Mount Sinai that's covered with all this stuff and all this manifestation and power is going on, you say, I can't process this. But the same word that's given to Moses in all of this, Yeshua Jesus is telling those guys and all the people in the multitudes he spoke with, with the voice of a man. You can't process that, but you can process the voice of a man. Is that awesome? Or am I the only one who thinks this is awesome? This is awesome. I mean, who would think of a plan like this? Right? If we made up our own plan of salvation, it would be simple. Lord, forget about everybody's sin. Just don't worry about it anymore. Everything's cool. Everybody's saved. I think that's a great plan. Who would have thought of this? Who would have thought of this? Why, when you study Torah, is there all that bloody mess? Body parts and blood and fat and burning and... Because sin is messy business. It's going to be dealt with here, with blood and with gore and with organs and messy business. We don't even care about sin anymore in the world. Nobody even knows what it is. You know, when you try to lead somebody to Jesus and you mention sin, you know, young people will look at you like, what? Because they have no idea. They have no idea that they stand condemned. They think they're good. So we're afraid of this. And so we got a new plan now. Peter says... Peter wasn't nearly as dopey after Pentecost. <laughs> I like to point out. <laughs> Second Peter 1.16, For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord, Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. We saw everything he did. Not just the miracles. We heard the teaching. We saw the miracles. We saw the food multiplied. We saw the healings. We saw him transfigured. We saw him risen. We saw him walk through the wall and come into the room where we were hiding. Because what did we do? We went, we ran and hid. What would we have done? Run and hide. You know, Peter kind of represents us at so many different levels, like they all did. You know, we can talk a good story, but were you wouldn't have gone up to the cross that day and said to those Romans, hey, you know what? Because they would have killed you too. They ran and hid. We'll follow you anywhere. These guys you can't trust. I'll go with you anywhere. I'll die with you. You're with him, aren't you? What? Who? I don't even know him. Never heard of them. A few hours later, never heard of them. When we're confronted by people who are talking about the most gross, heinous kind of lifestyles and sins, and you think to yourself, wow, you know, I, I, I don't know, I better not say anything. Well, no, I better get out of here. We all would do, would do what Peter did. Then he spoke to them. No flashings, no thunder, no shofar blasts, no lightning. He spoke to them sitting around campfires, sitting around tables, at the coffee shop, he, teaching in the temple. And they always came and said, but what authority do you do this? Who gave you permission to be preaching in here? And you notice, he doesn't debate his authority with them. He's like, whatever. I don't have to justify myself to you bozos. So now he speaks to us. 
we don't see him and feel him and talk to him like John did. But he talks to us and we know he's here wherever two or three are gathered, whenever you're praying in a little room and he's there with you. He's listening to what you're saying. Just like he listened to John, just like the other guys, just like he taught those other guys. He teaches you in a little different way. But he's still speaking with us. So they experienced him with their senses, but they understood it in their souls. Not right away. I love that scene in The Chosen where he's talking to Nicodemus and John and I can't remember who the other one. There's a couple of the apostles who are in the next room and John's writing stuff down. And the other guy says, you ever heard anything like this before? <laughs> oh, because of course not. But later on, they would understand what this was. You know, you can learn all kinds of facts about the historical Jesus, right? You can spout off all the stuff. You can read books. There are books written about him. Secular books, religious books, movies. You can know all kinds of facts. But down in your soul, do you know who he is? Have you met him and said, yes, I've experienced him? Not like John and those guys, but I've experienced him. And that day, that night, that week, whatever it is that I met him, I haven't been the same since. Not just a historical figure, not just a good teacher, not just a good philosopher. So they understood it. They were with him. And because they were with him, the spirit was also with them. You know, when you come to know Jesus, the spirit comes and dwells in you, right? And every believer, the Holy Spirit dwells in you. I mean, in you. That's why Jesus is talking about worshiping in spirit and in truth. That's why there's so many references in the scripture to, you don't have to be in a stone temple or you don't have to be in a stone cathedral to pray and to worship because he lives in you. It's fine to go to those places, but he lives in you. So they hung around with him. They came to understand he was the Messiah. The Holy Spirit came to dwell in them. That's why in um, Matthew 13, and Luke, has, Luke and Mark have it too, but I can't remember the chapter, but Matthew, I'm pretty sure it's 13, where they ask him, how come you talk in parables to all these people? You don't talk to parables in parables to us. What's with that? Like, you know, you're talking to these people, you're telling them stories. Well, you know, there was this man with two sons and the one of them. Uh, you never tell us stories. <laughs> What's with that? And he says, well, to you has been given the mysteries of the kingdom. I go, what? Us? Mysteries? What's the kingdom? <laughs> Oh, come on, that's a little bit funny. So, you know, how could they possibly understand that? You know, at the Last Supper, he says, when the Spirit comes, you know, the world doesn't know the Spirit, but you know him. It doesn't record they made any responses, but I picture them sitting there going, what? We, we know who? Spirit, we know. Okay, I don't know. Hey, it's Passover, let's eat. <laughs> that's what they're thinking. But they had the spirit. They had the mysteries of the kingdom because they were with him for three years. And so John says, I declare this to you so that you can have fellowship with the believers and you can have fellowship with him. Because through Yeshua, Jesus is the only way that you can have fellowship with God. You can't do it any other way. Right? Can't do it any other way. That doesn't make any sense. It's a foolish message, but it's the truth. So it's our only way to fellowship. So he says it completes our joy. So our joy can be, for, can be 
flow. You know, your sins are forgiven. What can make you happier than have your sins forgiven? I mean, one minute you're on your way to hell, the next minute you're justified. And what do we think about that? Oh, yeah, yeah, I heard all that. Yep. Yeah, I heard all that before. Yeah, well, today I'm kind of tired. Yeah, I heard about all that. I'm just going to go take my pills and lay down. I don't want to do it. Anyway. Your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. That should make your joy complete. And we become adopted children, Romans 8. We go from being slaves to being adopted children. We become co-heirs with Christ, tells us in Galatians. The Spirit tells us we were adopted. The Spirit told those guys, hey, you guys aren't just stupid fishermen anymore. You guys are in a totally different position now. And guess what? When the full outpouring of the Spirit comes, you're going to go all over the world and tell people about this. And when we have that, we'll go all over the world telling people about it. The world doesn't want to hear it. Okay. Just like, you know, he tells Ezekiel, I'm going to send you to tell somebody something. If they listen to you and they're converted, great. Good for you, good for them. If they listen to you and they're not converted, well, good for you, bad for them. But if you don't go, then bad for you and bad for them. I'm paraphrasing. <laughs> but no matter whether they listen to you or not, what does he tell them? They'll know that a prophet was there. Because they'll know this wasn't an ordinary guy making ordinary conversation. He wasn't talking about the Guardians game. He wasn't talking about the weather. He was telling me, I'm a sinner in need of salvation, and I got the solution to it. What? They'll know something happened that's not usual. Adopted children. So he forgives our sins. He conquered sin and death. So he says, your joy should be complete. He conquered sin and death. Conquers sin, that's pretty good news. Conquers death, that's really good news. The last enemy, Paul calls death the last enemy. It's the one thing everybody's afraid of. The last enemy. Conquers it. So we should be happy, we should rejoice. This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. You say, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know God, I have fellowship with God, but I'm living in darkness and I'm sinning and I don't know about this Jesus business, but hey, I know God loves me. God is love, which he's gonna say in chapter four. He says, you're fooling yourself if you're walking in darkness and think you're having fellowship because you don't have the truth. You can be a really good person. You can be very charitable. You can give all your money away. But if you're walking in darkness and you don't know Jesus, you have no fellowship with God, regardless of what you do. So this is the message. God is light. If we walk in darkness, we don't have light. We don't have fellowship. I don't remember the reference, but Jesus says, what fellowship does light have with darkness? They can't have fellowship, right? So if we walk in darkness, he's all beauty and perfection. You know, he's summarizing this in terms, but he's saying he's all beauty, he's all perfect, um, perfection, purity, wisdom, holiness. He's the ultimate revelation of this in a man. We saw it. We got all this, and now we want to tell you so that you can get this and your joy can be complete. Otherwise, you're happy, but you don't have joy. On the day you die, you're going to have zero joy if you don't get this. And if you think you had hell on earth, you're going to be sorely mistaken, because when you go to the real hell, you're going to wish you were back to your problems here. <laughs> so darkness has no fellowship. And he says his sins are, our sins are forgiven by his blood. And not only do we have fellowship with him, 
but it gives us fellowship with each other. You know, I always forget, I always remember, really struck me as a brand new believer and going to a charismatic prayer meeting for the first time. And there was a list of things like, you know, gifts of the spirit and, you know, how the spirit does this and does that. And the la the very last thing that was listed always stuck in my mind. And it was when you're filled with the spirit, you recognize other people who are also. And you want to hang around with believers. You want to hang around with people that are that have the spirit. You want to hang around with people that want to declare this to others. You don't want to hang around with people who are leading any kind of dark whatever. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar. If you say, I don't have any sin, you make God a liar. Because imagine saying that, and all of a sudden, a scroll opens up. And he says, uh, this is from since this morning. Do you say you have no sin? I got a list here since this morning. Do you want to go further? And we're the people that are believers. Imagine the people out there who have no concept of this, but they think that they're good. I don't sin. I don't know what that is. <clears throat> they make God a liar. When I witness to people, I always threw in, did you ever see the passion of the Christ? And people either said, no, I didn't want to watch it, or they went, yeah. And I'd say, pretty hard to watch, isn't it? It's horrible. I, I, it, yeah. So the question then is, if you could go to heaven by any of 58 different ways, or you could go to heaven by being good and nice to people, then Jesus had to be mentally ill. Why would he go through that? Why would he go through that brutality if he could go to heaven just by being nice? He could have come and said, be nice. Okay, he wants me to be nice. How nice do I have to be? <laughs> be good. Okay, how good do I have to be? Uh, perfect. Ooh, well, nobody's perfect. Exactly. So if we say we don't sin, if we say we don't have sin, we make him a liar. And we deceive ourselves. But after all this stuff he talks about perceiving God, human form in the incarnate deity, the creator becoming the sin bearer, which you can think about the whole rest of your life. The creator becomes the sin bearer. He says, if you confess your sins, he's faithful to forgive them. He's not going to say, nope, sorry. Not that one. Hey, listen, you know, you got 10,819, I'll forgive all but two of them. But those, forget it. You're damned anyway now, so have a nice life. No, he's faithful and just to forgive them. And the whole rest of the book, we're not going to do Maybe we will do some of the book. I don't know. But when you go through the rest of the book, he talks over and over again how this is how God manifests his love because he sent his son to die for you. Sent him to die for you. He doesn't just call out from heaven, I love everybody, I love everybody. Doesn't matter what you do, love everybody. He does love everybody. But John's point is he sends his son so that sin can be forgiven and that there's no other way. So that's the beginning of his, the, his first cute little letter. Second John and third John are really cute little letters. I mean, they're like, this long. Maybe we'll do all three of them now. <laughs> all right. Let's wrap it up. 